Well, good <clears throat> afternoon, everyone. And uh, we've got some strange things going behind the picture here, but okay. Welcome again. This is um, program 12. And we are dealing with discipleship in the new age. And uh, this is the 22nd of July. This is how I list it, uh, Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 1, Section 1, um, Part 3, Video Commentary. Uh, I've been away for a while. I had a wonderful visit from my daughter, Heidi, who, as many of you know, is an excellent uh, esoteric astrologer. But um, since I'm kind of a bit um, immobile here in Finland, uh, I'm not traveling to the United States at this time for many reasons. And um, so uh, we got quite a bit accomplished here. And uh, I've prepared some, well, there are some interviews <laughs> that will be coming up where Heidi is interviewing me about various things, you know. Uh, I, I don't think I look like a seventh ray fashion plate exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, my, my beard is too long and all the rest of it, but you'll just have to forget the outer form. We uh, third ray types, we always say that, you know. So uh, that will be coming up at some point and uh, you'll be able to get my opinions on many things. I, I said to Heidi that uh, this is as close to an autobiography as we're going to get. And uh, I dealt frankly with many issues. None of us, you know, is perfect by a long shot. And uh, so all of us have plenty to improve. And I was very frank about what those issues are for me, hopefully encouraging others to be frank uh, as well. Uh, I think tomorrow um, I'll be doing, well, actually it doesn't, it's not relevant because of when you will be hearing this, but uh, we have all of the serious Leo full moon things coming up and uh, it's one of the most important of the spiritual fest festivals. So um, my method now is a little simpler. I'm not um, uh, coloring, color coding everything here on these, um, on the text. And also I'm not enlarging words beyond reason. It just takes too long and uh, there, there's much to do. So, just follow along with me if you're studying and hopefully uh, in addition to reading every word of Master Decay uh, in these various uh, video commentaries that I'm focusing on, um, in addition to that, there will be other suggestions and other links which I hope bring forth the light. Uh, it was, I think, um, looks like it was uh, at least almost a week ago that we were working on this. And now I am on page <clears throat> 22. And we'll see how far we get. The um, 
the little segue from the previous program, um, flexibility, flexibility. The disciple grows through intelligently adapting his life to these requirements. I've gone over them in the previous um, reading, previous program, as far as is reasonably possible and not, and this is really vital, and not by adapting <clears throat> the requirements to his life. We, we see so much of that. Now, there are some uh, statements in the Alice Bailey books, which to certain uh, minds that consider themselves modern minds, there's a certain, uh, I'm sorry, a certain uh, objection. This is not modern, you know. Well, no, it's not modern in the fad sense of passing modernity. Uh, it is long lasting. And so, of course, excuse me, they blame Alice Bailey for having written it because the Tibetan never would have written such things. So they think when in fact the truth is that Alice Bailey uh, being closer in a way to uh, the humanity uh, at her time knew what you could say and not say at least and not offend. So I guess the story goes that she was often moderating the Tibetan, so that uh, he was not so utterly, utterly frank as originally he intended to be. Uh, and there are so many people, you know, the, the issues uh, concerning the Jews, the issues concerning modern world religions, uh, the issues concerning homosexuality and all that. The Tibetan was extremely direct. And um, I think Alice Bailey moderated that a bit in her collaboration with him. But uh, as she did say, if I were to ever change a word uh, without the Tibetan's permission, he would drop me as his amanuensis immediately. Now that's a pretty, uh, pretty stiff discipline under which to work. So anyway, uh, the flexibility, flexibility within certain limits is always needed, but that flexibility must not be set in motion by any personality inertia, which let me say would be kind of the refusal to change even when no one knows what is required and then going on or mental questioning. I mean, the concrete mind can throw up all kinds of questions, which basically block the simply stated requirements by the Tibetan. So let us be as sure of the requirements as we can be. Treat them very seriously as if they were, I, I would say, the most important things uh, in our lives, or at least uh, one of the very most important things and not fool ourselves or anybody else uh, with the old Alice Bailey couldn't have said that. 
uh, well, uh, or should we say, the Tibetan couldn't have said that, it's Alice Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> that is what I meant to say. I am kind of sorry about the ohms I can generate. Uh, I used to be an opera singer <laughs> and I could come forth with a nice, strong, healthy ohm, but that ability has uh, gone away from me. So, um, it's just one of those, one of those liabilities at the moment. So please forgive me for uh, the weak ohms, which I generate, generate at least outwardly. Um, it's not like me, it's not even like me for the last few years, but now that's how it is. Okay, so that's the end of program 11. It took us a few pages, and now about six days later, here we are with program 12. Um, no personality inertia must be responsible for our, I suppose if that was a green background, you wouldn't be seeing those little ghost uh, images. Um, we all have this Tamas, T-A-M-A-S. We all have personality inertia in certain respects, some more or less than others. And we are likely to question uh, what is simple, a directive, statements from the Tibetan or, or what are simple directive statements from the Tibetan and our old mental illusions get in the way. Well, if we're really going to be members of the new group of world servers, we have to, at least the kinds of servers that we are, we have to at least give his statements a fighting chance. He doesn't ask us to accept anything uncritically, but hopefully with the building of the Antikarana, our, um, our intuition is becoming sharper. <clears throat> yeah, well, today is an important day where we're going into Leo. We'll have an ingress meditation shortly, leaving the sign cancer and uh, those two signs together uh, are starting points for a certain type of astrology one very much having to do with the past cancer and one having a lot to do with uh, the radiant solar life of the future so anyway, going on with the Tibetan, a change in this relationship between disciples is now being made. And of course, this all was written back in the 30s. Uh, I think my friend Keith Bailey knows better exactly when these books were uh, written, but at least in the 30s, that's when all of the Dina one material, I think, was generated. An attempt, he goes on to say, uh, that is, DK does, an attempt is being made to being set on foot to see if a group activity and interplay can now be set up on the physical plane involving consequently the use of the etheric body and the brain. And may I say, this would be a advancement in the uh, 
externalization. Let's see if I can get rid of this. At least lower it a little bit. Externalization process. It would be an advancement because in this whole process of externalization, the physical plane has to be involved. And of course, the etheric body is actually a physicality. It, it is the real physical body. But as always with the hierarchy, they make attempts. They have to test things out to see whether really humanity is ready because they cannot estimate exactly. There's even or was disagreement apparently among members of the hierarchy as to the readiness of humanity for certain types of information with masters um, Moria Kutumi and Joao Poole taking the affirmative that let us try to see whether humanity can respond and others basically saying not ready. I'm reminded, you know, sometimes uh, I see movies <laughs> and they're wonderful movie with Tom Cruise and uh, a Japanese actor. I'm not sure if it was called The Last Samurai, but basically Tom Cruise was somehow, uh, somehow incorporated to teach uh, warfare or methods to a group that was supposed to um, combat samurai warriors. And they did so poorly um, compared to the fighting skills of the samurai that he just had to say, not ready. And, you know, so often that kind of assessment applies to us. So um, an attempt to see the readiness or non-readiness of human beings and of uh, members of the new group of world servers um, is put in motion. And let's see about the, the whole uh, problem of sex, DK says even the hierarchy doesn't know where it will end. It's pretty, pretty severe and there are many malfunctions in the understanding of the purpose of sexual relations. So going on with DK, the difficulties confronting you, he's talking to, you know, the disciples in general, he's not writing the private letters in this section of the book. That would be section two, a lengthy, lengthy section. The difficulties confronting you are, therefore, great. And may I add that it was no easy thing to be in DK's groups with the pressure of the group gaze, the group gaze upon you, and the constant thought that the master could evaluate you and your progress or non-progress at any point eyes were upon you. Sometimes we think, well, if I had been in that group, I would have done better. I never think that because I just 
realize how difficult it would have been. And of course, in the future, we'll get another chance. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, DK says, the difficulties confronting you are, that's present tense, right? Are therefore great. And I am anxious. Think of it for a moment, if I may add. The master is anxious. That's the word he uses. Is it the same as when we use the word anxious? I think it has sufficient similarity. So he says, and I am anxious that you should realize this. May I add that uh, so people called together won't just think it's, uh, as we say colloquially, a piece of cake, no problem, right? Well, then why was there apparently group failure, though maybe many individual successes? And then who am I to judge? This is um, what apparently has been the case. DK goes on, will you realize, for instance, that any differences of opinion which may occur in the relations of this group of disciples will be caused by astral brain reactions. And may I add, you know, that's a fruitful source of glamour on the physical plane when the astral body uh, takes over and influences the brain and the physical plane. And so uh, DK goes on and therefore must not be considered of any importance whatsoever, astral brain um, reactions are not to be considered as of any importance whatsoever. We have to have a certain indifference towards them. One of the techniques in the a book, Glamour World Problem, is the technique of indifference, along with the technique of light and the technique of uh, the presence. So we are discounting those things, and we just set them to the side. Although they seem maybe important to us, they just are not. And so, going on then with DK, they must be immediately, notice the word, immediately eliminated and wiped from the state of mind and uh, of the memory, the state of the memory, and classed as entirely personality limitations and unworthy of hindering the group integrity. Well, may I add, that's quite a difference, isn't it, in how we usually respond. Uh, differences of opinion. So the, uh, what Master Mori calls, uh, the wordy disquisitions of the concrete mind, they just get in the way. And they are personality limitations. And the group integrity is the important thing. Easily said, but when you're in the midst of a difference of opinion, it seems uh, 
that these differences are important and someone is right and someone is wrong and so forth. Just ponder for a moment the differences of opinion that have arisen in your group or groups and which have somehow compromised the group integrity. It's, it's a big step to immediately eliminate those things and always have in your mind what is best for the group, what is best for the group integrity. These are the kinds of issues, the kinds of questions which will be uh, thoroughly examined during the Aquarian age. An age of wonder. All we have to do is uh, get through the preparatory period in the right way. We still have uh, almost a hundred years before Technically, in the year 2117, we will at least have astrologically entered the new age and be quite done with the uh, liabilities of Pisceanism and sixth rayism. <laughs> which still have to be faced quite seriously. I mean, they are absolutely necessary signs and variously in the book, you will read how valuable they have been. But of course, we cannot hang on to anything forever. And when we do try to do that, it simply indicates uh, lack of imagination, lack of intuition, and plenty of fear. Plenty of fear. Going on with DK. This experiment being attempted by a group within my ashram, um, well, I suppose that means they are accepted disciples, but maybe it also means that there is an inner group within his ashram, which is assisting with the experiment. So anyway, DK's words, this experiment being attempted <clears throat> by a group within my ashram is one in mental relations and soul contact. Uh, and may I add with um, a reduction in the usual kind of personality uh, contact. I mean, we have, let us say the mind held steady in the light because there is real soul contact. And uh, DK goes on, um, it is an experiment with the emphasis and attention placed basically there. And by that he means upon mental relations and uh, via soul contact, which is helping to create the mind held steady in the light. 
the mind held steady in the light of the soul. It makes you wonder, doesn't it, uh, whether <clears throat> our current groups um, measure up to those requirements. I mean, how many groups in the world right now do measure up to those requirements? <clears throat> The attention is placed basically there in the soul mind uh, union. Then he goes on to say the astral physical brain reactions should be regarded as non existent. Let me say, you know, as if we are really uh, indifferent to them. They don't count. They are not of moment. Uh, they should be regarded as non-existent and as illusion <clears throat> and should be allowed to lapse below the threshold of the group consciousness there to die for lack of attention. This is, uh, may I add here, death by attrition. There's no feeding power of the attention as if these things were really uh, important. Likes and dislikes and personal points of view that have nothing to do with sustaining the group integrity. DK goes on, this type of group work is a new venture. Even though, let us say, begun in earnest uh, 90 years ago, or even almost a, a hundred years ago. I mean, what is, what is new <laughs> compared to the vast history of humanity? Uh, DK says, this type of group work is a new venture. And unless something definitely new emerges, as a result of this experiment, the time and effort are not warranted. And that word is emer emerges, isn't it? Something must manifest. Something must appear objectively as a result of energy expended. The master does not want to waste his time the, or the time of the real inner ashram, a larger group than those through whom the experiment is being conducted. We have to respect that, don't we? Um, so that the time and effort um, are warranted. A lot of time and effort are spent working through groups like our own, more outward outwardly constructed groups. We don't want to be, do we, an energy drain upon the ashram. And yet may I add that uh, the experiments will go on. 
that's the only way the inner ashram and the master will know just how we uh, will respond. We'll know the degree of our fitness for something new. P.K. goes on to say, you must not imagine that the particular line of work on which you may be engaged is the factor of main interest. It is not primarily the unfoldment of the intuition or the power to heal or of telepathic efficiency, which is of importance. Then what is? What is of importance? And may I say that we will probably find the answer to this question to be a thought which produces increasing decentralization. So he says it is not primarily, may I add uh, tangentially it may happen. These things may happen, but not primarily as the major purpose, no. It is not primarily the unfoldment of the intuition, it may happen, or of the power to heal, that too may happen, or of telepathic efficiency, which is of importance. And here comes from his words. What is important, that which counts with the hierarchy as the ashram's uh, function is the establishing subjectively of such a potent interplay and group relation that an emerging world unity can be seen in embryo. Uh, it makes me think that the Theosophical Society somehow was supposed to demonstrate a new quality of brotherhood, which could be an example for uh, others, but uh, much of those early theosophical efforts descended into criticism and uh, ambition and strictly academic interest. What could we say that the, those who were attracted and uh, at one point DK says, primarily the devotional type that they were not ready. You see, my friends, we have to prove our readiness for the new possibilities offered. So I'm gonna repeat this, what he says, what counts, because when he says this counts, that counts. Well, okay. We know we're really being alerted to something of importance. That which counts with the hierarchy as the ashram's function is the establishing subjectively, and may I add, subjectivity is not the same as subtlety. True subjectivity is of the soul. So 
the establishing subjectively of such a potent group interplay and group relation that the emerging world unity, may I add the, the hallmark of the Aquarian age of universality going on, that the emerging world unity can be seen in embryo. Think about that. There has to be a model upon which uh, the many can um, create similar possibilities. Going on with DK, a joint power to be telepathic or a group capacity to intuit truth is of value. He's, may I say, he's not discounting the value of these ancillary capabilities. And he adds, and somewhat novel. You'll be, you know, the first on your block. <laughs> to be telepathic or intuitive. So at one point I remember him saying, well, if you're excited by the fact that you are the first to receive these teachings, you automatically prove that your attention is in the wrong place. So anyway, we have some ancillary co-joining um, possibilities for some at this time novel capabilities, but that's not the point. The real primary point in DK then says it is the functioning of groups who have the ability to work as a unity, whose ideals are what, whose personalities are merged into one forward swing, whose rhythm is one, whose unity is so firmly established that naught can produce in the group the purely human characteristics of separation, of personal isolation, and selfish, selfish seeking, may I add, so common. When these things are established, uh, DK tells us that they are new. It's all these things that are new, all these things. Now you, you ponder for a moment. Do our groups have this humanity, shared idealism? merged personalities and in going really spiritually forward uh, and identical rhythm, which means that we can work with emphasis and power and an inviolable group unity. So all those usual separative things don't arise. I, I have uh, give great credit um, to uh, Gloria Crook and the 
Dallas School of the Ageless Wisdom. I don't know what it's called now, but uh, she had some wonderful experiments. And uh, she says every group goes through the state of forming, storming, and norming. It's very wise. And obviously, such a group as DK is here talking about um, is no, is already formed, is no longer storming, having all kinds of personal disagreements, but is establishing certain spiritual norms that one works through and which one observes uh, as necessary for uh, an ideal functioning of the kind conceived by the members of hierarchy. Something came up there and a voice that is not mine, but basically a voice, uh, maybe an electronic voice came up and reread just what I read. I don't know how that happened, but indeed it did happen. So not being of the, uh, mm, solidly technical type things happen to me in my recording for you uh, which uh, are unexpected that sounded to me like a uh, a special type of electronic voice i don't know if you heard it or not but uh, maybe it's something that can be used that i am unaware of but anyway this is what they're looking for. And that is what is new. New. <clears throat> new. And this is one of those statements again that DK makes, uh, and which is one of the golden statements. Unselfish people are not rare. Unselfish groups are very rare. Pure detached devotion in a human being is not rare. But to find it in a group is rare indeed. And he really, you know, he, he warned us about this. Basically, um, he said that in the future, what could arise are selfish groups, much more dangerous for humanity's welfare than selfish people per se. And lo and behold, it has happened. There are groups and uh, you find them maybe with certain corporations and political parties and even uh, church groups that are selfish. Maybe they don't even realize it. Maybe they think that it is exactly how one must be because maybe Darwin said so or something, you know. Uh, it's a kind of a social Darwinism, the survival of the fittest group and all others, well, maybe they don't survive. 
the survival of the most advanced people. Okay, and whether people who are deprived of many opportunities survive or do not survive is no concern of theirs. It has happened. And um, one of those sentences that always stops me in my tracks uh, is that um, capitalism has uh, emerged or arisen and wrecked the world. Well, that's a, such a judgment. I mean, basically what it means is that non-sharing has arisen and wrecked the world. Hoarding, cornering the market, getting everything for yourself or in this case, for your group has arisen and wrecked the world. Well, the Christ cannot return until a measure, and he knows the measure, of sharing uh, internationally and nationally has arisen. You will know. And right now, <clears throat> although sharing does exist, it has often such a selfish motive and not an altruistic motive. All that has to change and in the Aquarian age that will change. It just depends on how we, much depends, shall, shall I say, on the manner in which we enter the Aquarian age. Going on with DK, the submergence of personal interests in the good of the family or of that of another person is often to be found. For the beauty of the human heart has manifested itself down the ages. But may I add that goes only so far. DK says further, to find such an attitude in a group of people and to see such a point of view maintained, may I add not just a, a sudden impulse which appears and then goes away <clears throat> and is not really a sustained process. So from DK, to see such a point of view maintained with an unbroken rhythm and demonstrating spontaneously and naturally this will be the glory of the new age. Excuse my kind of backrest here.
well, at least we know what we have to look forward to and how we have to build towards these possibilities. Sometimes it almost seems uh, impossible, given the prevailing selfishness and the acceptance of this selfishness as natural. Actually, it's um, maybe part of what we call old Adam, you know, in the Christian terminology. But it's um, not spiritual. Spiritual spirituality is that which improves the human condition, the greatest good or the greatest number. And obviously, we're talking about a kind of selfishness, which only improves the material lot of a few. And yet it is accepted as how things have to be. Well, obviously we cannot go on with that. Going on here with DK, to see the link of pure love and of soul relation realized and utilized in group form and work is indeed new. And the attainment of this is the idea I set before this group of my disciples. All this the master says. And I hesitate to say, but I know it's somewhat true that these are matters of uh, words, simply words. Too many of us. Probably there's someone in your group or groups with whom you find yourself in personality disagreement and in a state of criticism in your mind more often than not. I know I have often experienced this. I'm not talking about what's directed towards me. I'm talking about what I wrongly <clears throat> direct towards other people whom I should be relating to through pure love and soul relation. So DK goes on. Remember, he's starting a whole new disciplic experiment here. If this group, he says, measures up to the vision as it exists in my mind, there will be established upon the physical plane focal points of specialized force. And may I add, he means the 10 C groups, <clears throat> focal points of specialized force 
through which the hierarchy can work with greater surety than heretofore. And may I say, we have to treat the vision which Master DK has as a very serious thing and something that can help mold what is intended. The vision of a master is much more powerful than simply the vision of an ordinary disciple or even of a discipleship group. So I would say many of us are under the impression of Master DK's vision. going on with DK, there will, through this and analogous groups, may I add, he never wants to centralize his group or its members um, into thinking they're the only ones that would really be movement uh, in the wrong direction. Uh, there will, through this and analogous groups, be set in motion on Earth a network of spiritual energies which will facilitate the regeneration of the world. Now, pausing here, just think of improvements in the areas which the seed groups cover. Telepathy, accurate observation of reality, healing on all three levels, education for young and old, politics, religion, science, psychology, psychology, economics, magical process. You've got to admit that these 10 areas are quite comprehensive and can lead uh, to a general regeneration of humanity if properly launched and sustained. So again, from DK, there will be through this and analogous groups, be set in motion on earth, a network of spiritual energies which will facilitate the regeneration of the world. Going on, he says, the influence of these groups, when permanently established, now may I add they were very inchoate, very much in the formative stage, so again, repeating, the influence of these groups when permanently established and potently working 
will have a wider objective than just the elevation of humanity. And I, I have a feeling uh, here that we're dealing with um, the elevation of the various kingdoms in nature. For which humanity is the macrocosm, but maybe um, the elevation of still higher kingdoms. The uh, potent rhythm which animates the inner, inner brotherhood of the Lodge of Masters will make itself felt everywhere on earth. And these groups, if successful, may be regarded as the first step towards the emergence into manifestation of the Great White Lodge. And so really, those who are involved in the 275 year seed group project are really part of the externalization of the hierarchy. That's a very big responsibility, a very big deal. But always, you know, Master DK offers the balance uh, as he does here. But remember this, he says, the keynote of the lodge is not attainment or degree. May I add that just, that goes on forever. And is very centralizing upon the sense of being the isolated individual. So it's not attainment or degree. As some of the occult orders seem to think it is. He goes on to say, it is stable relationship, unity of thought, plus diversity of method, of effort, and of function. So may I add within that unity is diversity. That's one of the keynotes of the Aquarian age Diversity in unity, unity in diversity. It is a stable relationship. Unity of thought plus diversity of method, of effort and of function. And, and this is one of those golden statements and its quality is friendship in its purest sense. Now, what does that really mean to us? Friendship in its purest sense, when you <coughs> when you call someone a friend, it is the imitation or at least alignment with what is the one of the major qualities of hierarchy, friendship. 
in its purest sense. And may I add, what would that be? You know, always thinking of the spiritual welfare of your friend. It certainly isn't crit criticism that you're going to correct the things that are wrong with your friend. It may be that you do something of that nature, nature, and you set an example which helps. But this is a keynote of the lodge, and I find it very beautiful. Quality. Friendship in its purest sense. The brotherhood, says DK, is a community of souls who are swept by the desire to serve, urged by a spontaneous impulse to love, illumined by one pure light, devotedly fused and blended into groups of serving minds, and pausing, note the capitalization there, and then going on, and energized by one life. Its members are organized to further the plan which they consciously contact and with which they deliberately cooperate. So there are so many different definitions of the qualities and even the nature of the brotherhood. And I suppose we really need to collect them uh, to get a, an overall point of view. The brotherhood, says the Tibetan, is a community of souls who are swept by the desire to serve, urged by a spontaneous impulse to love, illumined by one pure light, devotedly fused and blended into groups of serving minds and energized by one life. That's a pretty thorough definition. The members are organized to further the plan, which they consciously contact and with which they deliberately cooperate. And this is DK talking in all of this. Uh, and then finally, he concludes, and we will take it up later. It will be apparent to you, therefore, that the purpose of these groups is to unfold in time the three major powers of all illumined minds. Uh, so friends, that will be the end of this particular program, which is uh, program 12. I'll get this to you when I, as soon as I can. And uh, as usual, basically with this particular method, We've only gone a couple of pages. Program 13 will begin. Um, Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 1, Section 1, Talks to Disciples, it's called. Section 1, um, Part 3, Video Commentary, and whether 
that is tonight or some XX day, we will see. Because he's going to be talking about um, the threefold purpose of these groups. So um, let's just say there's lots to absorb here. And it's all spelled out clearly. What is the real objective of forming these groups? And mainly the contrast between the selfish and unselfish people and the selfish and unselfish groups. So lots of love, many blessings from Tuya and me and from the whole communications group, uh, uh, BL and Joe and Michael Stacy and Michael Crow and uh, occasionally uh, other helpers as well. We'll be back with you as soon as we can. So bye for now.